Y'all now, if you listen to Dog Man 101, Dog Man 102 criteria that I use for stories, guys, I'm loosening the criteria to put out more content for you. This story, in my opinion, is slightly exaggerated. Not overly exaggerated, slightly exaggerated. Well, I believe that this gentleman saw a dog man absolutely emotion that I witnessed on conversation. It, he saw something. On fire, he was very caught in fires and working in a dangerous environment. The only thing that threw me off about this was as we go through conversations, multiple conversations, about five, say maybe six, it's five, I kept referring back to November 23rd um, as the start date for when he had this happen in the house fire. And when I went back to go check, I didn't find where that fire had made it all the way down that ridge until. The so I went back and I looped him in the conversation, kept loop, kept loop, and I injected into agreement with me that was on the loop wasn't like, are you sure it's 20? It was just flip straight. So you went, you guys had a guy pull over on the side of the road, to the fire truck, told you that his mom was stuck, trapped, told you that his mom was trapped in the burnt house. This is on the night. And then it's like, yeah, it was on a night. Um, when I look people like that and they just agree with what I'm saying, it always sits with me like it's not 100% true. But at the same time, I'll say this about him. Um, did end up having a stroke. And so could have been attributed to the stroke, his memory loss from that stroke. So I decided to go ahead and encounter. Normally, I wouldn't even reduce this encounter. Because I want to keep my criteria so strong that uh, when the haters come and be like, oh, his stories are fake, this is this, this, this. I mean, it's, we're lowering the standards, so I'm not going to worry about it. And on the playing field, everybody else posts my own match. So let's see how that works out as I actually play them. Nonetheless, um, the other thing that got me about the story, for me all, was coming to the fire department, trying. Or his mom. I'm thinking if it's my mama, then I'm going to burn up. I can't really couldn't determine based on that one fact. It's human nature is different. There's certain, the level of bravery in certain men are it's different. I'm saying like, it's my mom. You know, I'm going up in the house. I ain't waiting on nobody. I'm going my mom. I'm saying, if I got to get a wet blanket and wet it and wrap it around me, I'm going up. Oh, that dear guy did have kids in the car with him. Um, so that's the factor that made a difference. Could have not liked his mama. I don't know. Those are the two factors that gave me concern about the story. Nonetheless, still a little story I enjoyed. I'm hoping you're going to love it again. Reminder, Thursday night, Men of Steel prayer group. Be there. Men of Steel dot com. Men of Steel dot com. Men of Steel dot com. Check it out. There for the Bible study. You're going to enjoy this one. Gonna enjoy this. And let me say this up. Um, I had a comment. Normally I'll respond to comments, but I think it's good to respond to this about somebody saying, Oh, you're trying to inject God into cryptids. No, no, no. Here's what you need to understand. Here's what's going on in the seal for the longest. You see, every time eyewitnesses have one of these harrowing, uh, uh, hair raising encounters or a near death encounter, because every time you encounter a cryptid, it's a near death encounter, it puts you in the same state of mind in one direction or the other. They either go back towards being worse than what they were um, and spiral downward into all kind of perversion, all kind of crazy stuff, alcoholism, drug use, or they turn to God. And what's happened in this field for a long time is people are afraid to add that element into it because they didn't want to offend certain Because there's a lot of you know, in this field that don't believe. Frankly, I don't care. No skin off my back. You don't like it. Don't listen. It hurts me. Now, let's get down to the story. Let's bust the move. Let's make it happen. Peace. It was one of our top stories of 2016. And, in fact, in all of Tennessee history. The Smoky Mountain fires in East Tennessee. Consuming decades of memories. And also claiming the lives of more than a dozen people. 
News Channel 5's Matthew Torres takes a look back at one of the most tragic incidents Tennessee has ever seen. It is the most visited national park in the country with more than 11 million visitors a year. From Sky 5, you can see what makes the Great Smoky Mountains so great. This is a special part of the world uh, for a long time, and it will remain that. But the home to a picture-perfect backdrop recently captured some of its most devastating moments ever. Go, go, go. Wildfires quickly ravaged mountains and the popular tourist town of Gatlinburg. This is the largest fire in the last hundred years of the state of Tennessee. Officials say the fire started in the chimney tops by two juveniles right before Thanksgiving. By the night of November 28th, it became unstoppable and took everyone by surprise, prompting a massive evacuation. The winds is what got me. The winds were so bad, things were blowing and breaking. Hurricane-like winds and severe drought conditions helped flames devour everything in its path. The result? An apocalyptic nightmare. More than 17,000 acres burned and more than 2,000 homes and businesses destroyed. Hundreds were forced to stay at shelters. This is our life here. These are our mountains God gave them to us to use and to enjoy. And to see it happen like this is just, it's terrible. It took almost a week before homeowners were allowed to lay eyes on what's left. For hundreds, it wasn't much. You know, I was a fireman for 31 years and I've never seen anything of this magnitude. I mean, I've seen houses like this, but I mean, not whole neighborhoods. November 22nd, 2016 was one of the greatest days in my life. That was the day that my son was born. And when I tell you my wife and I were ecstatic, we were absolutely ecstatic. It's nothing like having a child of your own. In fact, I found that me being the father made me over time become more selfless, more mature, and more importantly, brought me closer to God. However, November 23rd, 2016 was the day I almost lost my life. And it was a juxtaposition between that happiness of having a son and finding myself in the middle of a raging fire trying to save the lives of other people that damn near broke me. There's something about when you find yourself in danger, I mean mortal danger, your life flashes before your eyes. You've heard people talk about it before. Well, that really does happen. As I found myself in this situation during the Gatlinburg fire, my life flashed before my eyes. I realized that I didn't want to die. And it was while I was having that realization that I didn't want to die that I had my encounter with what you would call a dog man. Now stop right here, let me rewind and bring up the speed on what was going on in a moment. Now if you don't know, that was one of the worst fires in modern history. 14 people lost their lives, countless amounts of property damage. And let me say this to you listening, there's absolutely no way that I would have ever thought about seeing a werewolf in the midst of a fire, but it absolutely made sense. I mean, we as humans flee forest fires. Wild animals flee forest fires. Why wouldn't these cryptids find themselves in situations where they needed to flee as well? When those fires started, no one imagined what the end results would be. Lord knows I didn't imagine it whatsoever. I remember turning on the TV, seeing the fire, and getting the call to head into work. The evacuation orders going out, and making up in my mind that I would do whatever I could do to help my fellow citizens. Fast forward to 11 p.m., November 23rd. We are out helping people evacuate. The fire is starting to rage and roll downhill. The wind is kicking up and it's a wind unlike anything I had ever seen. In fact, I'd seen forest fires. I've seen household fires. I've seen houses burned down with people inside of them. But I've never, ever seen anything like this. We find ourselves in this situation. A gentleman pulls up in his vehicle and tells us that his house is on fire and his elderly mother is trapped upstairs. So we race over to the location, head inside the house, and sure enough, this elderly woman is there, laid at the top of the steps, choking on smoke. And as I'm carrying this woman down the steps, she starts to talk about Timothy. And she's talking about Timothy like Timothy is a baby. She says, oh, my sweet Timothy, don't leave him up there, my sweet Timothy. In my mind, I'm thinking that Timothy is a child. At no point in time, was I considering that Timothy was an actual feline, a cat. 
I get her down the steps outside of the house. The team is spraying water on the house. I head back inside looking for what I thought was a child named Timothy. I go into that room. The walls and the ceiling are on fire and I see nothing. Absolutely nothing. A few seconds later, this brown and white cat darts from under the dresser, through the open door, down the steps and heads out. So now I'm st- and I need you to understand. Like I told you, I thought we were dealing with a person. Now, as I go turning to leave the room, going back down the steps, the ceiling starts to collapse. And I find myself in a situation where the ceiling towards the front door is falling down and is on fire. Now I have to jump over the banister and find another way out of this burning house. And here in this moment is when I had my encounter with what I'm calling a dog man, because as I'm circling around that house looking There is a side door. And when I tell you I run full speed and run through that door to get out of that house, I slam my body into that door, stumbling outside, fall to the ground. And when I stand up, relieved that I'm outside of the house, and that's when I look uphill behind the house and see this creature jumping and leaping through the fire. And when I tell you this looks like something from a freaking horror movie, nine feet tall, muscular, and it's just bounding and leaping, barely touching the ground. This thing lands about 15 feet away from me, looks directly at me. And I still remember this as clear as day. Its fur was smoldering with the fire, then whips his head, takes off around the neighbor's house, and is gone. Now, I don't know if you've ever found yourself in a situation where you sweep something under the rug. You know, you experienced something, you know it was real, it happened but it was just way too much going on for you to deal with it and process it in that moment. Over the next couple of days, we were fighting one of the worst fires in American history. And I couldn't process that in that moment. It wasn't until the next month when I sat down, thankful to be alive, thankful to be with my family, that I really turned my mind to what I saw. And I made sketches of it and it fits the exact same description what you call a dog man. Do things seem off? Trouble sleeping? Issues in your marriage, finances, or with extended family and friends? These are challenges that many men face, but you don't have to face them alone. The Men of Steel Prayer Group is here for you. We are a fellowship of individuals who share a common interest in the paranormal and cryptid fields, united in our quest for understanding the supernatural. Our goal is to educate and guide those curious or seeking insight into the supernatural, emphasizing the role of Jesus Christ as the supreme authority over the supernatural realm. Visit us at strongmenpraying.com to learn more. The Men of Steel Prayer Group, where faith and curiosity forge a stronger spirit. Now, let me say this to you, ladies and gentlemen, there are little towns and places that exist in America that we probably will never know about or would have never known about outside of many of these encounters. And this town um, that this gentleman visited in this encounter, this church that he went to was a place that I would have never, ever conceived existed. I mean, I would have never thought that there was a place like um, it's a great encounter. I'm hoping you guys are going to enjoy it. And we're off to the race. We are absolutely off to the races. Now, sideboard me. I need you guys to know Thursday night, if you signed up to be a part of the Men of Steel prayer group and Bible study group, Thursday night, 7 p.m., we are having Bible study. Be looking in your email box because you will be getting your email inviting you, giving you all of the details. This is not the closed group. This is the open group. Um, it's not the creators group. It's a group for everybody. So um, you're going to enjoy it. You should come. The lesson is on altars, um, how they work in a Christian's life, uh, how to set one up in your household, which is how to invite God into your house. Um, and so God can be your defense. And so you and your family can prosper. And it's, t- it's a timely message for the new year. I mean, this is something that you should be doing at the beginning of the year if you have not done it already. So Thursday, 7 p.m. That's when it's popping off. If you have, if you still want to join prayer group, 
Uh, the website is strongmenpraying.com, strongmenpraying.com. Go submit your email address, get added to the list. You're going to get hit up and you're going to follow through. That being said, join the show. This encounter happened to me in 2016. And I'll admit to you, at that point in time, I found myself in a strange place. I had recently lost my job. And if it wasn't for the substantial amount of savings that I had, man, I really would have been screwed. But as time passed on and my savings started to dwindle from paying rent and bills, I decided the best thing for me to do was to live out of my van. So I decided I was going to have the most epic road trip take 90 days, travel around, enjoy the world, and then try and find another job. Now pause right here. Let me say this to you. I started playing poker when I was 12 years old. My dad taught me how to play poker at the kitchen table. I played with him and his friends. When I tell you him and his friends were poker sharks, I'm talking about the kind of guys that played in poker tournaments and won. And so while I was traveling on the road and when I got low on money, I would stop by a local casino and, and wait for an evolution of people to come to the table that were suckers. Now, if you don't know this about poker, there's always somebody who's at a poker table who's too aggressive or there's somebody who's too afraid. And if you know how to pinpoint their tendencies, you can walk into a casino with $150 and walk out with $1,000 if you know what you're doing. Now, the circumstances that led up to my dog man encounter weren't directly correlated to the fact that I played poker. It was more correlated to the fact that I was low on money and I was heading to play some poker. I find myself on the road, I-20, headed from Marshall, Texas to Shreveport, Louisiana, when I get a flat tire. It's 2.30 a.m. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with I-20, but people speed on I-20 and it's pitch black out there. I'm trying to change this tire while my vehicle is on an incline on one of those steep Texas hills. When I tell you this is a hairy situation I found myself in, this was a rough one because I wanted to make sure that my vehicle didn't roll backwards. So I went into the woods, found rocks, came out, put rocks behind the front tires, and I'm sitting there working to jack this van up into the air and put the spare tire on when a pickup truck pulls up behind me. Now, two o'clock in the morning, the pickup truck pulls up on you on the side of the road, there are bright lights on, and you got to be prepared for anything. So now I'm standing there with the tire iron in my hand as this young man gets out of his vehicle and says, hey, sir, how can I help you? And let me say this. This gentleman was the most pleasant person I have ever met in my life. He walks over to me. He says, hey, I saw you on the side of the road. I figured you needed some help. Do you mind? If I help you get your tire changed and make sure you get back on the road safely. Listen, there are times when being a poker player and being able to read people is an advantage. And this was one of those times. This kid didn't give off any bad vibes whatsoever. In fact, I felt like I was safe just because he was around. And so we get to changing a tire and he starts talking to me and he says, where are you going? And eventually I start telling him a little bit about my story. Telling him I'm headed to a casino because I need to play some poker because I need to make some money. And I've been traveling around in my van. He starts to ask me where I've been. Just as we've got the spare tire on and I'm putting the other tire in the back of the van. He says, when's the last time you went to church? I look at this kid and by kid, I mean 23, 24 years old. And I say, quite frankly, I haven't been to church in years. That's when he goes on explaining to me that he's a youth pastor at a place called Church of Uncertain. Now stop, pause right here. And I heard a whole bunch of church names. The Church of Christ, the Church of the Latter-day Saints, St. Elmo's Church, St. Pius Church. I had never heard of anything called Church of Uncertain. 
So now I'm standing there thinking to myself, okay, all right, this kid's probably in some kind of cult, and that's why he's giving off this vibe. Now, as I'm shaking his hand to thank him, he says, listen, I pulled over on the side of the road because God wanted me to stop and talk to you. And so if you just allow me for a few seconds, let me share something with you. And right there on the side of the road in the middle of the morning, he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with me and invited me to come to his church. Now, something weird happened when I shook this man's hand. This feeling came over me, this feeling of peace, like no matter what was going on, everything was going to be all right. He hands me this little business card with the church's address and says, listen, next time you're coming in this direction, stop by the church on a Sunday morning. I would love to see you there. And then he turns around, gets in his vehicle and leaves. I head on in the Shreveport, pull into the casino parking lot, catch a couple of Z's. The next day I go to the poker table. And when I tell you I rack in the money, I go in the door with $250 and leave out with $2,500. $2,500. When I finally head back to the van, I'm laying there catching some sleep. And it dawns on me. I think I'm going to go check out this church, the Church of Uncertain. Now, stop right here and let me say this in the story. What happened to me next had absolutely nothing to do with this church. I'm 100% certain of that. These were phenomenal people, real homely people. Everyone knew each other, kind, sweet, loving. But when I left there, what I encountered, boy, it was the exact opposite. So I head on over to a tire shop, get a new tire, come back to the casino, do some more gambling. I gamble all day Saturday, go back to the van, go to sleep, wake up in the morning, and I start heading to this address in a town called Uncertain, Texas. Now, let me say this about these people at this church. First of all, I want to thank them. And I did thank them before I left because it was doing that church service at the Church of Uncertain in Texas that I realized something. I realized that my life wasn't bad off at all. And in fact, I realized that God loved me so much that as a 12 year old little boy, I learned how to play poker and I was able to sustain myself from a skill that I learned at 12 years old. But I also learned that day when the pastor was preaching that God wanted more for me. Also, after church, we had a bite to eat, and it was just the most amazing experience. It felt like being at home with family, and that youth pastor who helped me on the side of the road, he was there. And when I tell you this young man was ecstatic to see me, he was absolutely ecstatic to see me. Now, let me say this to you. What happened after leaving that church, I do not attribute it to the church or God or anything else. I really, really just believe I picked the wrong place to decide to spend the night. So I, because I head on over to a campground right around Cato Lake, park my van, hang out outside, smoke a few cigarettes, listen to music, relax, chill. I mean, it was an awesome day. One of the most awesome days I had had in quite a long time. And then the freaking sun went down. And when I tell you, there's nothing more spooky than the border of Texas and Louisiana. When the sun goes down, man, I tell you, there's nothing more spooky than that. 9 p.m. rolls around. I got everything locked down. I got my seatbelts attached to my door handles so nobody can sneak into the vehicle. I lay it down. I go to sleep and wham. Now, I'm not sure if you ever heard the sound of sharp nails scratching on glass but I learned at 1 a.m. that's exactly what I was hearing this high pitch screeching sound and when I open my eyes and move the curtains I see this paw not a hand a giant paw with these long nails just scratching along the window on the back side of my van. Now stop, pause right here and let me say this. At first in my mind, this was somebody playing a joke on me. I'm thinking, okay, they got some local kids in the area. Maybe it's some kids from the church or maybe it's some of their friends. I don't know who it is, but they decide they're going to come out here and they're going to play a joke on me. And it wasn't until the van began to slide, not shake, 
but slide that I realize that no, this is not a game. There is something outside of my van strong enough to push this van like it's the Incredible Hulk and it is sliding my van towards two trees. Now, let me say this to you. I'm looking through the window trying to see what's pushing the van and all I see is fur. Imagine if your German Shepherd or your Collie was big enough to where it put its waist up against the back window of your van and that fur was pressed up against the glass. That's all I'm seeing. So now I go into panic mode. Mind you, I am in nothing but boxers. I hop up, climb to the front of the van, unbuckle the seatbelt, get into the front seat, crank it up and start to drive off. As I'm driving off, this thing is pushing the van, forcing me to go in circles. I'm talking about my foot is down on the gas and it is pushing me, forcing me to spin around in circles. When I look through the side view mirror, is the very first time I get a glimpse at what people call dog man. And this thing was massive, gigantic shoulders, big old biceps, huge legs. It has its upper body pressed up against my van like it's doing push-ups. And I'm saying to myself, I am about to die. I'm not sure why I was doing this. Maybe I was panicking, but I decided to blow the horn and just lay my hand on the horn. Burn. If anybody was nearby, they would hear the horn blowing and they would come and help me. Now, as I start to blow the horn, the van stops spinning and starts moving straight forward. But now I'm headed through the trees, headed towards the lake. And so now I have to cut the wheel, dodge trees, spin the van around, dodge more trees, and get back onto the roadway. As I'm cutting that wheel and heading back to that roadway, I see this thing making a B line straight for me, running on its hind legs. Let me say this to you, back in those days, I wasn't the kind of guy who carried guns on him. In fact, I felt there was no need for a gun, but after this encounter and this experience, trust me, I have loads and loads of guns, but I'm driving off. It's making this beeline for me and it goes into this cluster of trees. And truthfully, I've been thinking about this for years, trying to figure out why did it stop in that cluster of trees? Why didn't it go any further? But it gets into this cluster of trees and I don't know if it couldn't fit through them or if it didn't want to run over them. I don't know what the reason was, but it gets into that cluster of trees and it just stops. But me, I don't stop driving. I don't stop driving until I get back on I-20 and start headed back to Shreveport. When I'm on I-20, I pull over, hop in the back of the van, throw my clothes on, drive back to the casino, and park in the damn parking lot. Do things seem off? Trouble sleeping? issues in your marriage, finances, or with extended family and friends. These are challenges that many men face, but you don't have to face them alone. The Men of Steel Prayer Group is here for you. We are a fellowship of individuals who share a common interest in the paranormal and cryptid fields, united in our quest for understanding the supernatural. Our goal is to educate and guide those curious or seeking insight into the supernatural emphasizing the role of Jesus Christ as the supreme authority over the supernatural realm. Visit us at strongmenpraying.com to learn more. The Men of Steel Prayer Group, where faith and curiosity forge a stronger spirit. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? James Williams, Dog Wars here, and I'm hoping that you guys are having a blessed new year. Hopefully you started this year off the right way. Uh, I'm still getting used to the camera thing where it look. So my eyes may look a little shice until I figure this all out. I got to figure it out. But nonetheless, hopefully you're having a wonderful new year. You and your family are enjoying yourselves. Things are going fantastic for you. Your new year didn't start off with an accident or some type of tragedy or getting drunk and pulled over by the police or spending time in jail or anything like that. Hopefully you're not going through that. Even though I've talked to a few people who have been through that and that's not the way you want to start off the new year. I'm here for a couple of reasons. Number one, I want to say thank you. I'm going to say thank you to each and every new person that subscribed to the Dog Orders family. 
Um, I want to thank you to say a special thanks to all the people who've been members of the Dark Waters family from the beginning. I really appreciate you guys. I love you. I think you're phenomenal and amazing and awesome and dope. Uh, you're the best. I mean, you really, really are the best. Um, I got a story for you guys. I'll give you a little bit of background on the story. Also, I'm going to tell you some of the things that I'm going to be doing over forward this year. I am going to, for the first quarter, I'm going to be doing a hell of a lot more drops of content than I normally do. Um, in order to achieve that, I'm bringing down our standards quite a bit. Um, so you'll notice the difference, not in the way the story is narrated, but you'll notice the difference in the stories themselves. Um, because I'm going to dip into a pool of stories that I normally wouldn't dip into. But there's a reason why. I'm, it's I, Some people may say it's nefarious, but I want to see somebody go and find Dog Man. But I want us all to witness this person do the 72-hour challenge. But in order to get that done, I need to raise five more thousand dollars. And I'm not asking you guys for any money. You don't worry about it. I already got one person to sponsor. Um, but I need to do my part of the sponsorship. And I'm actually excited about sending someone into an area where I know there is dog. And then surrounding that area with cameras. And then seeing what happens. Because there's this phenomenon going on where I want to go find dog man. I want to find it. Hey, man, I'm going to make your dreams come true. I'm going to send you right to where they are. And we all going to, I'm not going to charge nobody to watch it either. We all just going to sit there and watch you for 72 hours in an area where these creatures are. And so, trust me, I told you guys we were going to do a camera project. We did it. It was phenomenal. Had this problem. People went crazy about it. They might have been mad at other people. Um, as you can see, it hasn't restarted and anything hasn't happened on its own without me, but nonetheless, we have be ready to do it again. This time, you the luck. And I know there's people who want to say, oh, don't worry, that's messed up. No, I ain't messed up. This is what you want. This is what people want. People want the blood. They want the gore. They want the excitement. So let's give them what they want. So as I dump, understand the reason why I'm dumping, because I'm going to raise the bread for this and we're going to do it. And I'm gonna have no mess with bomb because here it come. Here it come, baby. I'm excited. I tell you, I'm excited to actually let you guys see somebody go full retard. Man, I'm excited about it. Y'all don't understand. People do it all the time. We just don't ever catch it on film. So we're gonna catch it. Somebody go on full retard. And I don't think I'll be, <laughs> I don't think they're gonna really enjoy their experience. And hey, ain't nobody go out in the woods and scare you. The place you going is nice as a clue. It's going to require satellite internet in order to get the signal out there. I'm going to send somebody out there with you to set it all up. And then they're going to leave. They're going to leave you, baby. And you're going to be there all by yourself in the old man territory. Deep, 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 deep in the old man territory. I'm going to tell you now, when you go, I want you to understand something. That ain't the only thing out. It's not the only thing out there. So when we start doing this, I got a certain criteria for a type of person I'm looking for. I'm looking for a very special type of personality. I'm not looking for somebody who's a single mom who says she needs 10 racks to you. Sweetheart, you ain't gonna make it. I ain't looking for somebody who's a truck driver that's gotta go to work on Monday. Bro, probably got a family. There's special criteria I'm looking for because there's one thing, I never really discussed it. There's one thing that all the full retail people have in common. And I'm telling you right now, that's what I'm looking for. And it's going to mean for a phenomenal story for everybody to see live. I think it's going to be amazing. All right. Now, next thing, the story that I'm about to play for you guys uh, comes from Poplarville, Mississippi. Have you ever been to Mississippi? You know, Poplarville is uh, south of Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And the inside baseball on this story is... I don't think this was what you would call dog or dog man. I think this is what you would really call Rougarou. The Rougarou itself, the human being that converts into a freaking werewolf. Um, because as the story goes on, talking to the family, it turns out that this kid's pops wasn't really a good dude. And that screwed a lot of people over their construction business. And he had screwed over this particular woman who was known to be a hoodoo practitioner. Now, voodoo, who ain't? Those of you know, who know the difference, but nonetheless, 
this thing came after he screwed this person over. And so all I can tell you is you got to be careful who you mess with, man. You really do. I'm from New Orleans. We know this. You don't just run around messing with people. You never know who know who or who know what. And down there, it's more about who knows who as opposed to who knows what. But both of those things can hurt you. You just don't mess people over. Man. You take care of people. You don't screw them up. So with that being said, guys, let's start the most epic dog man content run we've ever seen. Nobody else is capable of doing this because nobody else has this level of content. They just don't have it. And I'm not bragging, they just, they just don't have it. Uh, the phone lines are going to be opening up for more content. So if you want to call that cell phone number, let me see where the cell phone is. Yeah. Fair for Bloom. I'm going to see a better color than Bibi. We're going to do it on Challenger. Here she is. You feel free to call a number and holler at me now. Some people may say, well, why don't you give out the number? I'll explain that as well. The number is posted everywhere. It's all over videos. It's all over. I mean, I've said it on interviews. It's somewhere in the description. The reason why you don't hear me spitting out this phone number on a regular basis is because you really want to share a true story with me. You going to go find this number. I don't have to just tell you the number every day in order to get the phone call. See, that's the first level of filtering out for me. If you want to contact me, it is here. And you're going to find a way to contact. If it's an inconvenience for you to tell your story, then you really don't give a damn about your story. Ever. And so that's why I don't run around. What's the phone number? I don't post it now. People ask me all the time. Nah, it's there. Go look for it. Because if it's that important to you, you are going to find it. Now. But there it is. For the new subscriber, just so you will know, because we're growing a lot. We get ready to go through another phase of exponential growth. People like to say we buy subscribers, but I mean, that's just because they don't know any better and they don't understand the algorithm. They say those things. Um, and by the way, you don't get those back there by buying subscribers. That beautiful, beautiful plaque right there. Uh, you don't get that by buying subscribers. You get that by being a dog. Nonetheless, um, for if, if you're new here, I want you to understand the thing there. Right. I don't do creepy pasta. Don't. I bet my story is by talking to people. You can't submit a story in the comments and then I'm going to read it. You can't email me a story and I'm going to read it. You have to spend some time talking. And in the process, we get to know each other. Uh, in the process, I get to most likely talk to family members and friends, depending on how important you feel like your story is to get out. Some people, not that important to get it out. They just want to talk to me. And we sift through that pretty quickly, figure out what's going on, move on to the next person. So when you listen to this content, you find stories that start and then they just stop. I'm like, well, what happened to the rest of the story? It's because that eyewitness experienced something which they didn't want to continue to talk about it. They said, okay, screw this. It's not worth it. And it happens over and over and over again. Um, I do my best to not disclose the location so we can prevent that. But still, nonetheless, it happened. So there'll be stories where you'd be like, man, you know, you never finished that story. That's because something happened with that eyewitness. And sometimes they'll come back and they'd be like, okay, we're taking a break from it. Things have died down. They settled down. Let's go back to it. But that's the nature of actually telling true stories. That's the nature of what um, gathering information is and getting the real intel is. It's, it's not linear. It's not like it just happens the way I want it to happen. Things happen the way they're supposed to happen. They unfold the way they're going to unfold. And that even makes the stories more richer. It makes the stories more powerful. Look at that bug. Um, and you enjoy it. All right. So that being said, ladies and gentlemen, here's your next story. Here's the beginning of the epic run. Uh, let's just do it. You know what I'm saying? Let's just do it. Let's do it to it, baby. Peace out now.
I know that this is going to sound very, very weird to you. But my childhood dog man encounter is directly correlated to my love for slinkies. I don't know if you remember the slinky, the song, the slinky, the slinky. It's a wonderful toy, a slinky, a slinky. It's fun for a girl or a boy. Yeah. My encounter is linked directly to the day I got my slinky. Understand growing up in rural Mississippi, there really wasn't much to do. And when I say not much to do, I mean there was not much to do. Play around in red dirt, every now and then ride your bike up the road. But if no other kids were outside, which happened quite often, you spent a lot of time alone. So I spent quite a significant amount of time all by myself, sometimes reading books, other times sitting on the porch, other times burning ants with magnifying glasses, anything I could do to occupy my mind. I remember it just like it was yesterday. When my mother came home with that slinky, the most fascinating toy to me that there ever was. Now, compared to the toys people play with nowadays, it's absolutely nothing. But for me back in those days, it was the most amazing form of entertainment. Fast forward a couple of days afterwards. It's early on a Saturday morning. Mom got us up, made breakfast. Dad left the house and went to the lumber yard. I'm sitting out on the porch playing with my slinky. I remember sitting on the top step and making a slinky walk down the steps over and over again. I had to do it about six, seven times, making a slinky go down the steps, getting up, going down the steps, picking it up, going back up to the top, making it go down again. And it was when I had my back turned to the roadway that I heard my mother screaming from inside of the house. Billy, get inside, get inside right now, Billy, get inside. Looking up, my mother standing there in the screen door, eyes as wide as saucers. Get in this house right now. Get in this house right now. Now pause right here, let me say this. When you're a kid and you hear your mom with that tone of voice, a mixture of anger and fear, you automatically assume that you did something wrong. And so that's where I was, I'm confused. Like what did I do? I'm just sitting here on the steps playing with the slinky that you gave me. Now, little did I know at that moment in time, it wasn't me that was in the wrong. It was the thing across the road behind me that was completely and totally freaking wrong. So now I have my head down, lollygagging, walking up the steps. When she opens the screen door, comes out, yanks my body and pulls me into the house, slamming that door and the front door behind her. Now, listen to me when I say this, no other time in my life would I ever describe my mother as being a badass than this one moment in time. And understand, I had no clue the reason why she yanked me into that house and closed that door. But what I watched my mother do next was march. I'm talking about soldier march into their bedroom, flip over the mattress, pull out the shotgun, walk back to the front door, out on the porch, and as soon as the door opens, she starts shooting. Now listen to me. I'm only 10 years old at this time, but I'm there peeking around her leg, looking as she's shooting, and it's a werewolf standing on the edge of the other side of the road. Broad daylight, werewolf, black as black can be, sharp pointy ears, about eight and a half feet tall, and she is shooting at it. Takes two shots, breaks that shotgun, reloads again, and takes two more shots. The entire time she's screaming, get your ass off of our property right now. I stood there in fear, hiding behind her body as she let off six shots at this thing and walks back into the woods across the road. 30 minutes later, my dad pulls up to the yard with a truck full of lumber. And I'm pretty sure it was the shotgun shells that set him off because you hear his foot hit the wooden steps. Then the pace of his footfalls accelerates rapidly and he comes barging through the door looking around. Is everybody OK? Is everyone all right? My mom and I are sitting there at the kitchen table and she tells him the Rougarou came and tried to take our son. That was the first time I heard about the Rougarou.
I've been paranormal investigating for about 15 years now. Not cryptid investigating, but paranormal investigations. Going out, trying to find demons, monsters, haunted places, abandoned buildings. I, I didn't really understand the concept of cryptids until I spent time down in Louisiana, north of Ruston. And in this case, I wasn't even doing an investigation. I went to visit my in-laws. Now, let me say this about my father-in-law before I get started in this story. My father-in-law is old school. He doesn't use any woke language. He doesn't bite his tongue. He just calls things what they are. So I want to prepare you ahead of time for some of the things that I'm going to say that he said so you won't be offended. Quite frankly, if you do get offended, I don't give a damn. But nonetheless, we head on over to their house, and as soon as we pull up in the driveway, he looks at me and says, boy, you done gained about 40 pounds. Like I told you, the man does not bite his tongue. We head inside our house. My mother-in-law, Mary, has lemonade fixed. We sit down at the table. We're drinking lemonade, and he immediately starts to question me. So how's your job going? Are you still doing that paranormal investigation stuff on the side? Chasing after those ghosts and those demons? Don't bring none of that stuff in my house. We worship Jesus in this house. Don't have none of that foolishness in my house. Do we understand? And I tell him, yes, sir, I understand. I wouldn't imagine doing anything like that in your household. He says, good. That conversation takes a hard turn right and goes into my job, asking me how things are going on my job. And I spend, and frankly, I spend the first three hours being interrogated by my father-in-law. And I'm not talking about a nice interrogation. We're talking about one of those interrogations where they ask you questions and make you feel stupid at the same time. But I understand him. I've known him for a long time. And more than anything, he's concerned about the welfare of his daughter. Pause right here. Stop. Let me rewind and explain to you why he and I are not exactly on the same page. Now, when I met my wife, she was working as a nurse in the hospital where I found myself sick. And you know what they say about men in hospitals and nurses. When you find yourself in a vulnerable state and a woman is there to take care of you, I mean really take care of you, it's pretty easy to fall in love. Women who are listening to the story, if you're a nurse, you experience this all the time. A guy falls for you while you're taking care of him, but you have absolutely no interest in him whatsoever. Well, in this case, I fell for my wife, but she actually did have interest in me. So once I was out of the hospital over the next couple of months, I would just drop in, bring her flowers, bring her candy, offer to take her to lunch. And finally, we started dating. Well, I got offered a job down in Houston and my then girlfriend, my now wife, decided she was going to leave Shreveport and stop being close to her family and move to Houston. But she didn't explain to her father exactly why she took the job. He found out on the back end that his daughter left following after me going to Houston and he just didn't like it. Frankly, and truthfully, I wouldn't have liked it either because the man had never met me. But nonetheless, this is how he and I got off on the wrong foot. And I tell you, it took a long time for me and him to get on the same page. And now back to the story. They own 18 acres of land a little bit north of Ruston, Louisiana. And every time I go visit him, he has a job for me to do on this land. This particular time, he wanted to fix the fence. So the following morning, he wakes me up at 5 a.m., he says, come on out here and help me fix this fence. No, we're talking about a real country fence, poles and barbed wire. And so now it's the two of us on his side by side, riding out to the edge of his property. And when we get to his fence line, it literally looks like something picked up one of the fence poles and walked away with it. I've never seen anything like this whatsoever. Something picked up the fence pole, the metal pole with the barbed wire on it. And just decided to walk back into the woods with it, dragging all of the rest of the poles with it. And so I'm standing there looking at this. And I'm like, Pops, I'm not really sure what's going on, but how did this end up like this? His reply was simple. I'm not sure either, but all I know is I want my fixed fence. So let's get it done and let's get out of here. Imagine a scene. We're back in those woods. Pulling that fence post and that barbed wire back to its original place. And every time we start to pull, it catches debris and sticks. And now we got to work our way in different directions. So now I make a suggestion. I say, listen, Pops, how about we just find the poles, cut the barbed wire, bring them, reset them, and run the barbed wire again. He looks at me and says, well, son, I guess you're smarter than what you look. Let's do it your way. So now imagine a scene. The two of us are back 
off in the woods, away from his clear land, cutting the barbed wire and collecting different poles when we hear this howling sound. And it's hard for me to, and it's hard for me to describe to you exactly what it sounded like because, frankly, I had never heard anything like this before. It seemed like it was a mixture of an animal and a woman scream started off like in this animalistic nature and then converted in the middle to sounding like a woman screaming, then converted again into sounding like an animal. We're talking about a howl that lasted about 16 seconds. Now my father-in-law's. Now, my father-in-law is standing there looking around the woods and then he says, drop all this, it's time for us to go. And I need you to understand something. I never seen this man afraid. I don't think I've ever seen this man worried. He was the coolest, most calm individual I ever met. But in that moment, something scared him because his exact words was drop all of this. We need to go. So now we hop in the side by side and take off speeding out of there. And when I tell you we're speeding, we're flying out of there moving so fast that at any point in time we hit the wrong bump with the wheel turned in the wrong direction that frankly we would flip over but he's pushing it we get back to the house go into the back door and he walks straight into the bedroom comes back out with rifles and says let's go back now stop right here in the story let me say this to you now i find myself completely and totally confused because a few minutes ago there was something making noise in the woods that scared you so much that you ran but you ran to get the rifle so we can go back. So I'm trying to slow him down. I said, listen, so I try. To, so now I'm trying to slow him down. I said, listen, hold on. What's out there in the woods that we needed to come back and get a rifle. Now I'm a Louisiana boy. I know what's out there in the woods. So I said, was that a pack of coyotes? Was it wolves? What do you think it was? That's when he looks at me and he says, listen, son, we got two options. We can wait for that thing to come up to the house tonight and harass us or we can go back to where we were and we can confront it back there and let it know that it should not bring its ass on this property now mind you he didn't tell me what quote unquote this thing was he just laid out the two choices for me both choices seem pretty freaking bad so now we're back on the side by side speeding at the same rate headed right back to the same spot except for when we get there his crazy ass drives straight into the woods and does not stop driving are you listening to me? He's driving deeper into the woods, dodging trees. And he says, I need to get its attention so they'll know we're here. Listen, we drive about 100, 200 yards into them woods. And I'm talking about dodging and swerving around trees. And he stops, gets off the side by side and starts screaming and yelling. Hey, I'm over here. I'm over here. I'm over here. Now, Paul, stop right here. Let me catch my breath and let me say this. Part of me thought that he had lost his mind. I'm, I'm being honest with you. Matter of fact, the entire time I've been married to my wife, I've thought that my father-in-law was crazy. I mean, he just comes across as being crazy. But in this particular situation, in this moment, I thought this man had really lost his mind. But boy, was I wrong. In fact, I was wrong about this scenario more than I ever been wrong about anything in my life because as he's there screaming, you hear it coming. Now again, I'm going to preference this with this so you understand. I am a paranormal investigator. It's not what I do for a living because you don't make money doing it. But it is my hobby and I have hours upon hours upon hours in the field doing paranormal investigations. So I know what a ghost sounds like when it runs. I have a damn good ear for sound. It's a huge part of being a paranormal investigator. But let me tell you this, so you can clearly understand me, that what I heard running at us did not sound like anything that belonged in the woods. Did not sound like anything that belonged in the woods whatsoever. Because it sounded like a damn giant running at us. You hear, boom, boom, boom. Boom, crack, boom, crack, crack, boom, crack, boom, crack, boom, crack. Those, that, that cracking sound is tree limbs breaking as this thing is running in our direction. And when you look directly north, you see trees shaking and moving. 
And my father-in-law positions himself on the other side of the side-by-side, gets down on one knee, and starts to take aim. I'm on the opposite side of the side-by-side, which is closer to where this thing is coming. And he says, boy, you might want to bring your ass over here and get ready to shoot. Now, what I'm about to describe to you right now, you ain't going to believe it. And I'm fine with you not believing it because I didn't believe it when I saw this shit. I honestly didn't. I thought that I was losing my mind. Because I come around on the other side of that side by side. I kneel down and I'm starting to take aim. When I tell you this thing was 16 feet tall and it looked like one of the trees was moving in our direction. That's what this dog man looked like. Now, listen, I understand that you're sitting there saying to yourself, you know, you're exaggerating. There's no way this thing was 16 feet tall. All right. I give or take two feet, 14 feet tall. But it wasn't no less than 14 feet tall. And it's moving fast. And then it comes to a screeching halt standing next to a tree. And I'm talking about a screeching halt. You see the leaf litter flying up into the air. And my father-in-law starts shooting. Pop, 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 pop. I mean, he unleashes on this thing. And you know how in the Superman movies, Superman just moves out of the way and a bullet goes past him? Well, let me tell you something. It had to see them bullets come because it just moved slightly to the right and those bullets hit the tree behind it. And next thing you know, it's circling around us, not circling around us like it's going to come in on us. It's just running in circles around us. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? Everybody want to hear a dog man story. I'm telling you my story. Are you listening? This thing starts running in circles around us and you may be asking yourself well how do you know that it was running in circles because you see the leaf litter kicking up in circles as it's running around then it stops in the exact same position and then it stops in the exact same spot where it was and my father-in-law starts shooting again boom 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 runs out of bullets takes the rifle from my hand and starts shooting that one Boom, 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 boom. When I tell you this was the most craziest that I've ever experienced, this was insane. As my father-in-law is shooting, it's moving back and forth, and then it starts to circle us again. Now, pause right here and let me say this to you. Now, at first, I thought my father-in-law was crazy, but this day, we bonded together, and I really grew to respect this man. Because as it's moving, he's saying, son, lay down on the ground, is trying to get me to shoot you are you listening to me so now i'm laying on the ground and he's turning trying to place a bullet on this thing as it's running around in circles and then it takes off back in the direction that it came listen to me when i say this to you about cryptids i have my own paranormal youtube channel where i ghost hunt i do all kinds of stuff but there's no way in hell that i ever consider being a cryptid hunter because the level of intelligence and tactics that this thing showed was absolutely terrifying. And you gotta understand, I didn't comprehend it all until we made it back home. We're sitting at the table, drinking coffee, when he said, son, I don't know if you really understand what it was doing. It realized that the two of us had rifles and it started circling us to make us not only waste ammunition, but to crossfire at each other. Now, I don't know if you was afraid to shoot or what was going on with you, son. But the reason why we're still alive right now is because you never took a shot. It realized that after I took the rifle from you and started shooting, that we had more bullets left. And that's why it went away. Now, listen, I'm not dog man. I don't think for dog man. I'm not inside of their mind. But according to my father-in-law, who's dealt with these things multiple times, that's exactly how they think. And to me, that's some terrifying man. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? James Williams, Dog Waters. I'm here, and I want to introduce uh, Jimmy Bar to you guys, or reintroduce Jimmy Bar to you. If you've never seen or never.
never had the opportunity to listen to the initial interview I did with Jimmy Barr last year, it is one that you want to hear. Now, Jimmy was on These Woods is Haunted, one of the highest rated shows that they had. And it was a Bigfoot encounter about him and his brothers and how um, Bigfoot threw a giant cinder block through their back door. Um, one of the most vivid Bigfoot encounters, descriptions that I've ever heard. Uh, and we know it's been vetted by national TV, so we know it is true. Now, what Jimmy talks about towards the end of this interview it's very, very, very interesting. Um, and it's something that I believe completely reinforces what I've been trying, the point I've been trying to get across to people over the past two years about what the purpose of this field is. And the encounters that people have, the why people have the encounters that they have. Um, and about people being broken in various different ways. I think it's real strange that most of the people who find themselves in this field they've had trauma at a young age when they were very little or at some point in their life and then they're attracted to this field that trauma that breaking that hurting that pain seems to be pause stop rewind not seems to be is something that attracts various entities into your life um, and that's something that I want to expose so people understand that don't hold on to that trauma that trauma is not a good thing. You need to do what you got to do to get rid of that trauma. Because um, it's hurting. It's like having a dead body uh, inside of your drywall. And that's how a lot of people are. They have a dead body behind the walls. They can smell it. And the smell is so strong. <coughs> the smell is so strong that they can taste it in the air. But they don't know how to get rid of that dead body. So man, don't be stuffing dead bodies in your walls is what I'm saying to you, man. Get it out. Just get it taken care of um, and move on with your life because that's what attracts things to you. That's why people are having these encounters. They got dead bodies in their walls, man. I don't know any other better way to put it. Get the damn dead bodies out your wall, damn it. Get them out your wall. Hurry up. Get them out your wall. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a listen to the Jimmy Barr interview. Um, and at the end, Jimmy has a very special ask for the Dog Waters family. And I'm going to ask that you guys help these people out. It's Christmas time. You got 20, 10, 20 bucks you can throw towards a family to help them. Um, do it for me. Look out for these people. You're not going to notice. You're going to notice that I'm doing it myself. I'm not going to ask you to do something that I won't do. Never will ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do. All right. Peace out, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy the interview. Do things seem off? Trouble sleeping? Issues in your marriage, finances, or with extended family and friends? These are challenges that many men face, but you don't have to face them alone. The Men of Steel Prayer Group is here for you. We are a fellowship of individuals who share a common interest in the paranormal and cryptid fields, united in our quest for understanding the supernatural. Our goal is to educate and guide those curious or seeking insight into the supernatural, emphasizing the role of Jesus Christ as the supreme authority over the supernatural realm. Visit us at strongmenpraying.com to learn more. The Men of Steel Prayer Group, where faith and curiosity forge a stronger spirit. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? James Williams, Dalt Waters, and I'm here on camera for once. I never really am on camera. This is like history in the making. I never um, got my cigar, but I'm here on camera, and I'm here with Jimmy Barr. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me say this about you, about Jimmy. The opportunity to spend some time with Jimmy is something that I really, really enjoy. Um... Jimmy and I started talking like last year, but what was really interesting about me having a conversation with Jimmy was that during that time period, there were all these people who were like, Dark Waters is the worst person on the world, blah, 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 blah. And Jimmy was like, I don't care. I'm going to do an interview with you. And so I appreciate you, Jimmy, um, spending time with me and having an opportunity to talk to each other because most people, when there's chaos and confusion, they run away from it. They're afraid of it. And you're just not that type of guy. Um, for those of you who don't know, Jimmy's been on multiple TV shows with his Bigfoot encounter. I'm going to have him touch on it. And then we'll spin and talk about some other things. So welcome back, Jimmy. It's good to see you, my friend. Man, it's been absolutely uh, an honor to have you have you back. Thank you so much for having me back. Um, it's always a pleasure uh, being on your show. Man, how has life been going um, for you since you exposed all of your um, your encounter? How's that went? I mean, you find yourself being a celebrity at this point in time. 
No, um, I tr I try to actually I I for the most part I I try not to do um the podcast and the shows and whatnot um just for the simple fact of um it's such a saturated market and and if I don't want to be that person that's on and everybody goes oh for the love of Pete this guy is just seeking the camera you know um i've turned down as many um podcast offers as have i been on um and i felt bad about it because i like the people it's just um um and then you know sometimes you get a podcast that the their, their crowd's not as friendly and then they decide to just tear you up in the comments and there's really nobody reining in the people and you know the trauma itself of having a big foot fall out of a tree five five feet from you is enough and, and now you got to relive the trauma and then be ridiculed all over again for it, you know, every single time you do a show. And, uh, you know, you can only put yourself out there so many times. My, this is me speaking uh, before. It just seems to be not worth worth it. You know what I mean? So it's better for me to pick and choose, um, you know, who asked me to be on. And, and when I uh, decide, yeah, I'll come on your show because uh what you got going on is great and um, the direction you got things going is, you know, great. You know, I, I don't want to go on a show that is just full of hateful people in the comment section. Um, that doesn't do anybody any good. No, nah, and that's a real life experience for people who are eyewitnesses. They, they come on, they share their encounter, and then they are literally just savaged in the comments and it's unfortunate because the way it affects the eyewitnesses they never want to speak about it again and that's one of the reasons why i always do my content and story form as opposed to interview form because if i'm in interview form with a person and you start attacking i'm gonna have to say something to the point to where it's gonna turn into an argument because people are just crazy. Um, so I've always stuck with the stories because it leaves a certain amount of anonymity for the audience, for the the person who had the encounter as opposed to the interview. Um, but nonetheless, it's one of those things where that's a part of this business. And to anybody listening yeah. who plans on being in this business and you plan on telling your encounter, know that you're opening yourself up to the public and be prepared to deal with the ramifications of it and you should be wise about who you go and deal with because there's some people who just care about the encounter they only care about getting the encounter recorded and once they have it recorded to hell with you you know what i'm saying um run them quickly through your encounter and then we'll spin and go to the next thing it was you and right on, your brothers right correct yeah um i'll give a cliff, cliff notes version of it my encounter was aired on the travel channels these what's are haunted season two um Episode seven, I believe it was titled "We're Goners," and um, I was probably seven or eight. My next oldest brother was nine or ten. My next oldest brother was eleven or twelve. We were two years apart. Um, and basically, the long and the short of it is, uh, we were chasing each other around a trailer that just got put there. Um, prior to that, when we drove all the way across country from Illinois to uh, um, North Carolina, as soon as we got out of the, um, my stepfather, he's Native American, he said stay out of the woods. There's a hairy man back there. And, you know, as kids hearing the words hairy man, you know, 40, geez, I'm 51 now. So 44 years ago, um, you know, it was funny to hear the word hairy man, you know, thinking, ha, 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 you know, laugh, you know, whatever. He didn't like as much. So his attitude was, well, I told you, you, you get eaten, you get eaten, whatever. Um, and we were running around in the woods about three weeks after we got there. Um, and my mom and my stepfather were gone for this, like day three. They just left me and my brothers. They were, they, they were gone. They just didn't come back. And um, we were chasing each other around the trailer. And we heard a scream from behind the trailer. It just sounded like a woman getting ripped in half. Just one scream. Just, ah! it's just terrible woman scream. And it was terrifying. And we went from chasing each other to we came together without saying a word. Just... We were drawn to each other without saying a word. We kind of moved as one unit to go back and kind of investigate whatnot. About 75 feet from the back of the trailer, we got Kate walked up, up on a tree and there was a crack up in the tree. And when I looked up in the tree, um, there was a, I mean, a, a six foot tall chimp in the tree, squashed down on a branch with his feet up against the trunk of the tree. It was about 15 feet. 15 feet up, that was the very first branch. 
And when we looked up, when we heard the crack and it looked down, its eyes got big and it started to stand while it was holding onto the tree. When it stood, the branch was on broke and it dropped right there by us, five feet from us. We took off running. My brother Bobby beat us back to the trailer. Me and my brother, older brother jumped into a freezer chest. It was outside the back door. And because my brother locked us out, you know, at, at 12 years old, there's no fight or flight. It's just self-preservation, you know. Um, but he got eaten alive. Um, by the Bigfoot community and all across the world and all the comments and everything, you know, how, because the actor that played him was probably 20, 22 years old instead of 12, like it should have been. Right. Right. And so it portrayed him as being much older. Um, but then the, the fact is this little boy that played me was probably the age of my oldest brother that locked us out. Um, and then later that night, uh, a bigger one came back. It looked nothing like it looked nothing like the one at the window or the one the one that fell out of the tree. The one that fell out of the tree was about six foot tall. It was built like a swimmer. It had a face like a chimp. It had the bubbled lips. Um, it reminded me of Caesar from Planet of the Apes. Its face was charcoal gray, the skin, and then it speckled into my flesh tone around the lips. It was just speckled into all you know pink, you know, right it right in here. It, it like freckled into one solid color right here. Um, it, it followed us back. It didn't um, chase us. It just meandered and followed us back. Uh, later that night, a bigger one showed up at the window when we were playing with the ghost gun. And um, it looked like a really, really, really old Native American combined with uh, a caveman. Um, it was cinnamon. It was not black like the other one. Um, and from here, to here took up the entire window of our trailer. Um, it, if it was standing straight up, it was at least eight and a half feet tall. If it was standing straight up, if it wasn't hunched over, um, it was ginormous. And then um, I just happened to be from me to the front of my windshield on my golf cart, which is five feet away from the window when the light went in his eyes. I jumped over the bed by the time my feet hit, a cinder block that the back door steps were made out of cinder blocks was thrown through our back door. Um, and then uh, we waited for my mom and dad to get home. My mom and stepdad to get home um, pleading our case because I had a very, very um, rough childhood, I guess. Very abusive, very neglectful, very... Um, I was told by most of my siblings, uh, cousins and whatnot, that we don't know how you guys lived. Uh, we were punching bags. We were stressed and leaves. We were slaves. We were whatever you wanted to, to call it, what, to make my mom feel better if it meant, you know, beating us with a board be, because she, she stubbed her toe, whatever. You know, that was my life growing up. And the real monster just pulled up in the drive when we heard the truck pull up because if we knew that she's seen that back door and thought we did it, we didn't think we were going to live through the night. And we rushed the door and told mom and my stepdad, the hairy man tried to break through the back door and they had a big old knockdown drag out because my stepfather never mentioned a word about a hairy man to my mom. And then it was, uh, I don't know, this big old fight in the kitchen punching and everything between the two of them. And later that night, um, we packed up all of our clothes and garbage bags and drove back to Illinois in the back of uh, El Camino after three weeks of living there. Yeah, man, the very first time. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to this, the interview was there. You need to go listen to the interview as he details it step by step as <clears> to <throat> what he encountered. It's This is one of the most terrifying things that I've ever heard. I mean, it really is truly one of the most terrifying encounters I've ever heard. Um, and it's also indicative of what I've been telling people about um, abusive households and some of the things that coincide with the things that go inside, go on inside of your household and how they relate to encounters that people have. Um, most creators don't touch on that. They only care about the encounter itself, but they won't go into how the background of the individual who had the encounter um, leads into these type of encounters. So, for example, if they weren't home alone, I guarantee you they wouldn't experience that the same way they did. There was a very is a reason why it happened when nobody else was there because those things have been watching them. All right, Jimmy, with that being said, you wanted to share something else with everybody. And I'm excited to 
hear mm-hmm. about um, this other encounter that you had. And before you start, let me say this, ladies and gentlemen, um, the men go through things in life and the way that we learn from each other is by learning from mistakes and experiences that others have had in this field it, that's kind of short changed because everybody focuses on a monster right and so the focus is on a monster that most people will never see they'll never experience it they'll never encounter it but the focus is on a monster and not the individual but when you start to focus on the individuals you grow as a human being because you learn so much from talking to people and this is what i like about being in this field and the focus of the dark waters channel is not just a monster it's about the person and so i'm interested um in in finding out what else jimmy wants to talk to us about so walk me through this other encounter jimmy well we're talking about my uh, spiritual experience yeah so um in the early 90s, I, I'm from Illinois. I moved to Florida. This is going to be a lot of personal stuff, but it, it's it's all relative and it's all important to lead up to what happened to me. Um, I had gotten married, fell in love with the, you know, thought was the love of my life, you know, and um, um, we got pregnant. Um, I, I was a strong believer of, uh, never get married just because you get pregnant. You get married for the wrong reasons. Never do it. I preached to all my friends. They didn't listen. Their relationships went to crap. And, um, you know, we got pregnant. I was absolutely fine with that. She hit me with a Mary, I'm going to have an abortion. And, um, I hated her, but there was no way I was going to have an abortion. Um, I had dreams about what my son looked like before he probably even had a heartbeat. And those dreams came true. He came out looking exactly what I had been. In fact, all of my children did, except my daughter. Um, And I think there's a reason for that. Um, And so... I hated her for it. She tried and tried, tried to make up for it, but I hated her for making me do something that was just against my belief, but I did it for my son. Well, we, um, my son, Zach, he uh, fell asleep on my chest every night for the first 18 months. And every night, that's how I fell asleep. Well, when we got separated, um, she had him and and I didn't. And it it caused me to have a sleeping disorder um, and it hit hard. And um, when we separated, she moved to San Diego and I went back home. And, you know, she wasn't supposed to go to San Diego. She was supposed to go to Pennsylvania and go to college there. That's why I decided to go back home to Illinois. It's a lot closer to Illinois to Pennsylvania than it is Florida to Pennsylvania. It made more sense just logistically. And plus, I had nobody down here in Florida. All my family and friends are back in Illinois. It just made sense. Um, So when I got back to Illinois, she called me from San Diego. And that changed everything. Um, Big fight about, wait, how can you keep my son from me? You know, blah, blah, blah. You can't, I'll never get to see him, you know. And um, words were said and guys, people say things out of anger. She was trying to manipulate me and just the words came out of my mouth. Look, if you try to keep me from my son, I'm going to get him and you'll never see him again. And you say dumb things, you know, you just, um, you know, the lack of maturity and age and whatnot played into it. There's no excuse for it. But, um, you know, when you're, you know, 23, uh, you, you don't really think a whole lot through before you talk. Um, and so um, this was, he was born uh, uh, January 15th, 1995. And um, since then, I've seen him three times. Um, she kept him from me. Um, we had mediations where I agreed to do everything she required from me, even though it was impossible. And the mediator said, you'll never be able to do that. I, may, I, I said that I would do it. And then she would end the mediation with, well, even if you do, I'm still not sure that I'll uh, agree to sign anything to let you have actual visitation rights in, in writing. 
So this pain that I had from being away from my son, um, um, I was the one that taught him how to walk. I had changed his diaper. She had never changed a diaper in her life. I had a younger sister that had four kids by the time she was 18. She had twins when she was 14. I had changed thousands of diapers before I had my own child. So I had the experience. I had the knowledge. I had the patience. Um, and it got to be too painful. It wasn't just an emotional pain. I couldn't sleep. My heart was hurting. And I, I didn't know how much more I could handle this. Um, because every day that went on was another day away from my son, another day of feeling the same thing, another day of trying to act like everything is fine, another day where I had no control of the outcome of anything that had to do with the most important thing in my life. So at this time, in, in, um, in 1999, I was working at a, a tire factory called Ridgestone Firestone in Bloomington, Illinois. And I worked in the prep booth, the North prep booth. And when you, in the prep booth, I just have to explain it um, so people understand the process because there's a time lapse. If you take a tire when it's raw before it's pressed, it's in the shape of a round trash can. It looks like a barrel. When you put it in the press, it pushes the sidewalls together and the sides actually come out and make the, tr the tire. Okay. So you got the sidewalls where the rims go and it presses the sides out. And so I have to drill a hundred holes in the sidewall on each, each sidewall, because when you press it, if trapped air gets trapped, it's going to make the thing wobble and it allows the air to escape once it gets pressed. So I just stab right through these things. I'd be, I was breaking records on my ninth day there at Bridgestone Firestone. It was a union job. And I was told, you want to keep this job, you got to bust your butt. Um, I wanted that job. It was the best money I'd ever made. And so my ninth day there, I was breaking records at a two man job. My 13th day there, I was training people. So Within three weeks, I didn't have to wait 90 days. They moved me to full time. So I was crushing it and just, you know, stabbing this tire, a drill bit with an ice pick on the tip of it. I'm just crushing it. It takes me no time to get through these things. Um, I was working at Firestone and every night, um, every night I told myself, this is the night. This is the night I'm going to go home. I'm going to swallow all those pills. I'm going to drink everything I got, and I'm just going to finally get some sleep so I don't have to feel this anymore. Every night I said this. Every night I said this. Um, but I also worked at an ag chemical warehouse, um, and there was a, uh, a cat barely weaned um, in our heated warehouse, and he was batting around a half-dying mouse that had eaten rat poison. He was going to eat it. And... I couldn't let that happen. So I ended up basically taking this kitten home and I had him for two or three weeks. I just kept calling him Kitty until the name came to me and Kitty was the name that stuck. Um, so every night I'd come home from work and I worked the, the D shift. So Monday, Tuesday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Then the next week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I had off. And Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, I worked 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. D shift, dog shift. And so one week I worked 60 hours. One week I basically worked uh, 24. But they would roll over 20 hours and give it to you. Um, but every night I'd come home contemplating it every night. So this is the night. This is the night. And I would come home. And when I would, as soon as I'd walk in the door, my cat would do some weird cute little cat type of prance and just bow up on me like let's do this and it would make me smile and it, and it would it gave me a, a reason to smile when I never thought I could and um all I ever did when I wasn't working was watch movies I never left 
I never went out. I had friends and family, but it didn't matter to me. Um, the pain was too much. And all I did was drowned myself in watching movies, 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 movies from the time. If there was a second I was awake and I wasn't work, I was just watching movies at home, isolated and watching movies at home. That's it. And this one night, um, I had made up my mind. Um, Kitty's full grown now. And um, this is it. I, I, I can't. I can't I can't do this anymore. And the pain, the pain, the physical pain, my heart was hurting. So I made that decision that day on the way to work that I'm finally going to get some sleep when I get home after work. And we was in the break room. Right after, during lunch, and I was uh, right across the North Prep booth is the tread station. And uh, his name was Brian, not Mike. Uh, black guy, super sweet, super cool. And uh, he knew my situation. He seen my pain. Uh, he tried to comfort me as much as he could without it being awkward. Guys, you know, being guys. And uh, I already made up my mind, and it was uh, – at lunch, on our way back, <clears throat> lunch for me was like, I think, midnight. Um, and us, and on our way back to the prep station, um, I made this comment. Man, I should have went to freaking college because this job sucks, but the money's too good. Um, and he's like, yeah, it's good money. I'm like, I ain't going to be doing it much longer. You know, I already made up my mind. I told him I wouldn't be doing it much longer. And he thought that was kind of odd because he knew my situation. So I walked up uh, to my tires, four tires hanging on a rack on this side and the other four hanging on a rack this side. And I grabbed my drill and I stabbed that tire just one time and everything went black. Everything went black and everything after that was in the form of a movie. I'm sitting in a movie theater. Everything went black. I'm sitting in a movie theater. I'm the only one there. It's a black screen. And if you and everybody that's listening, just close your eyes and picture how the rest of this plays out. Because this is how it played out for me. On the screen, a white G faded in. Right below it, a white O faded in. And then right below it, a white D faded in. And this is all playing out in movie form. Uh, the G faded into government. The O faded into organized. And the D faded into discipline. And that entire phrase melted away to smoke and it was like i'm in next scene i'm in college i'm in college i'm trying to figure out a way to get this last easy credit and i chose some course on religion and i figured it was just going to be a breeze a blow through a uh, whatever um I'm late getting into class because it's my first day. Um, and I walk in and the professor guy, he's teaching, um, wasn't too happy about me being late and kind of grills me for it or whatever. And um, I'm kind of a smart aleck. You know, I like to make jokes. And um, they start talking about giving money to God and, and, and and, you know, how much percentage you should give, you know, and me being the smart aleck I am, I made the comment, um, how are we going to give it to him? Are we going to FedEx it to him? Is this going to be a money order? What is the, what's, how, you know, uh, and he didn't like uh, that comment. I was in that class 20 minutes and I got, I got kicked out of college. 
I kicked out of college over a over a joke that I had made. And anything religious based, um, a lot of things religious based are, are controversial. And so it kind of hit the local news and they made a big deal about it because religion got kicked out of, you know, separate church and state and blah, blah, blah. I didn't care. I was just trying to get credit. And I'm on local TV shows. And the next thing you know, I get invited to be on uh, Jay Leno. And this is all still movie form. This is everything going on. Um, Jay Leno invites me on. And we start talking about it and yucking it up. And then he started asking me what my personal views were. And I'm, you know, I was like, I really, I don't know. I've never thought about it much. Uh, you know, what if God was just made up? What if God was way back in the day, whatever the king said, the peasants believed and the peasants were rioting. And the king said, tell them if they don't just calm down and relax, that they'll burn and if eternal fiery death and it worked but that worked here well it spread to the next kingdom and it spread to the next kingdom and it spread to the next kingdom like wildfire and 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 what if that's how religion really started i said i mean it's all just government organized discipline Wild dogs have an organized government, ants, birds, lions, whatever. You know, what if, what if it was just government organized discipline and it all led us to be a foul? And um, the audience was aghast. Um, and not because of what I said, but it was like a light that went off for them. So it wasn't shortly after that because of what I said, uh, the world really did start going to hell. Um, you know, when I was on the show, I had mentioned, you know, if there was no religion, people didn't have an incentive to do the right thing, be good to each other, be kind to each other and love each other and respect each other. We'd just be full of rapists and murderers, just like we were when the world got flooded in the first place. <laughs> Um, and that's what started happening. Um, I had paparazzi following me around with cameras. I couldn't go anywhere. So whatever I did, I was on the news in every country. And there were, it was, it was a terrible world disaster movie there were tsunamis, there were earthquakes, there were hurricanes, there were volcanoes, there were fires. It was, it was really a crap storm. Um, and it was because of what I said. And I was just throwing it out there. And I uh, walked out of my store. I live in the town of Atlanta, Illinois, 1,300 people at the time. And I, I walked out of my store and I could see tornadoes. And they were barreling in. As soon as I walked out, I could see the tornadoes. There's a paparazzi guy with the camera over here. There's a paparazzi guy with the camera over here. And I looked at the camera and then I looked up. And I said, You want everybody to believe? The whole world's watching. Prove it. And everything, everything went away. It just dissipated. Just, and when I went prove it, I was frozen, my arms out, and I lifted up. And as I was rising, and the cameras were on me, this thunderous, it sounded like if James Earl Jones said believe from the sky, it was just one word, but it sounded like thunder. And because I was being filmed, 
and this is still all in movie form, mind you, because I was being filmed by these guys with the cameras. When he said believe, and it sounded like thunder, it panned to Asia, where people were in the streets watching the big Tron TV thing on, in their streets. And they heard believe in their language. It panned to an Arab country where they're in the shack with the TV and their antennas up. They heard believe in their language. It panned to other countries and they all heard the word believe in their language. And all together, it just sounded like thunder. And When everything, when the lights came back on, I was sitting there frozen and I was bawling. I was uncontrollably crying. And I didn't know why, but I couldn't move. It felt like somebody took a bucket of warm water and dumped it on top of my head. And I could not move until it went from the top and it got down to my feet. I couldn't move. And when the sensation went away to my feet, I'm still stuck in this position. And I look over at Brian and he looks at me and he's like, dude. And I just feel like I don't know what's going on. How long have I been like this? He said, you just, you just went over there and stabbed the tire and started crying. And I, I don't understand why that happened to me. Um, there's so many more people deserving of it. But I, I went home and I hugged my cat. I locked myself in my house for about three days. I didn't watch a TV. I, I didn't, I felt like the wrong person got the message. You know, why was I so de deserving of yeah. what had happened? Let me say this to you. Wow. First of all, wow, wow, freaking wow. Um, what you experience is being called slain in the spirit. And it's when you're literally slain. It's like you're taken from out of your body and brought somewhere else. And the simple fact that you're thinking that you don't deserve it. God loves each and every one of his sons and daughters that way. That's, that's the most amazing thing about him. I call him daddy. That's the most amazing thing about daddy. We come to the realization that no, we don't deserve it. And, and we, as individuals, we're not worthy of it. But he loves us that much that he will move that length to that length to save us. So you're here today because he intervened, because if not, you would have done it. And that was his way of intervening in your life. And it explains a whole hell of a lot about you, Jimmy. Um, it explains why, to me, it explains why you had the encounter. It explains why you ended up where you have an opportunity to have influence it explains some of the other things that have went on in your life that we've talked about personally. Um, it explains a whole lot. But no, that's how he loves each and every one of us. And people have heard my my story of when I was suicidal, what he did for me. And there's something about that moment when you're going to make that decision to where he says, OK, you want to make this decision. Let me give you the option to understand that I'm really real. And he shows himself. He completely reveals himself and it's it's in different ways for different people but it's the perfect way for that individual you see what i'm saying so it was the perfect way for you to get the message there's no way you don't get that damn message you know what i'm saying you got the message and you didn't do it and um your life is better and the world is going to be better for you getting that message i promise you the world is going to be better for you getting that message um the simple fact that huh I, I was just going to say, go ahead. I'll let you finish because I can, I can mm, come back to go it. Go ahead. Say what you're going to say. Well, so my cat, um, 
my cat kitty became a huge, huge part of my life. And I didn't realize it. You know, sometimes you don't realize things until it's too late, right? Um, kitty, kitty stopped me 50 times from committing suicide. Um, kitty, I became so close to that cat afterwards because it was, I felt after that, like he was there for a purpose. Um, and I never put much thought. I tried to do the religious thing. I tried to go to church when I was a kid, but I had, I was baptized uh, as a kid. You know, I learned one Bible verse and they made me learn it and memorize it before. I, that's another thing. Uh, my memory is terrible. Um, but I remember that verse. They made me memorize John three sixteen before I got baptized. And um, I got baptized. My life got worse. The beatings got worse. The neglect, the starvation, um, the abuse, it got worse. And I thought I did something wrong. So a year later, I wanted baptized again. And it didn't get any better. It got worse. And it got worse. And I walked away from something that I put my all into um, when I was younger. Um, but Kitty, um, so I wasn't, I wasn't even spiritual. I, I, I didn't care one way or another. I know that I've prayed for things before, but it was never for me. It was pray to protect my mom. My, 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 my stepmother was more of a mom than my birth mother and pray to protect my father Anything that I couldn't get with my own two hands that I didn't deserve or need. So I never, yeah, okay, I'm, okay. I probably prayed for the lottery, you know, a few times, you know what I mean? That's kind of a given, but I never right. prayed, you know. Um, I didn't pray for me because I have felt for the longest time um, my prayers weren't worthy. They were never answered. And Kitty... So I got remarried. I got two boys. And at the time, when we moved from Illinois to Georgia, me and my wife and I worked our faces off. And we, she excelled at State Farm. I excelled. She, every time she got a degree, her income doubled. And she'd get her master's and her, 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 um, her bachelor's, and it would double. And then it would triple. You know, everything was going great for us. Um, we moved to Georgia, got a dream home, something we never thought we would get four-story house, 5,000 square feet on a lake, only access to it. Um, never thought we'd ever have a house like that, but we worked our faces off for it. And Kitty was with us still. We had all this. And Kitty died when we were in Georgia. And um, I actually, he couldn't walk, he couldn't eat anything. And so I had took him myself to the vet to be with him, to have the humane thing done. And, and they gave him the first shot and his eyes dilated. And, um, and they gave him the second shot. And when his heart stopped, that whole you know, before you die, your life flashes in front of you. But when he died, my life flashed in front of me. Because it dawned on me that second. And because of him keeping me sane, I have a beautiful wife, amazing kids. Great life, financially stable, and I never once thought to even think. And I was beat up, man. I didn't know how to leave the vet without him. I didn't know what to do. I came home and I cried like I've never cried. And it was that night that I found out that there is something after death. 
Because if anybody has ever owned a cat, or you're a cat person, and they get up around your ears, and they start purring, and you can feel that vibration in your ear, and it gives you that weird, ugh, chill feeling, you know, the cats do. I'm in my bed bawling. My wife's bawling that night. But I'm stupid bawling. Telling her, you know, I owe everything we got to him. I didn't even think it. I'm just, I'm a mess. The loudest purr I've ever heard in my ear. It made me gasp. I don't, I don't even like saying the word. It just sounds so cheesy to say. It made me sit up and gasp. I felt him. I heard him purr like a freaking lion in my ear. I sat up and I was like, <gasps> and I instantly, the pain of not considering what I had, um, had a lot to do with the cat that kept me sane, was gone. I was mourning my cat, but the pain was gone. It would never happen again. But there is something after we die. Because, again, my cat helped me with my sanity five hours after he died. Man, that's an amazing encounter, man. That's an absolutely, I mean, wow, mind-blowing encounter. It truly, truly is. And if there's anything I would say and it's this, it's that what I've come to learn, this is just me as a man speaking, what I've come to learn is that God meets us where he wants to and how he wants to. And he uses whatever he wants to, whenever he wants to, to get a message across to you. And I found that as I matured, he's met me in various different ways with people, things, places but it all got me to the point to where he wanted me to be. And in, and in my case, it was, I mean, raging waves that kept me alive. Wind blowing reeds over, bending them that kept me alive. Trees breaking that kept me alive because I, I didn't understand how to communicate with him at that point in time. So he communicated to me his love through what he had around me. And it sounds like to me, that's what happened to you. And that's a beautiful thing, man. And I'm happy that you have the family that you have. I'm happy that you're still here. And I'm I'm thankful that the Lord saved you the way he did. And I'm thankful for Kitty for being there. Um, he's the Lord of Spirits. He can use anything he wants to change your life at any point in time. And unfortunately, people don't understand that. They don't understand that love. They understand the pain and the hurt, but they don't truly understand the love that's there. Um, we're almost out of time. There was something else you wanted to talk about with a family friend that's going on with them. Talk to me a little bit about that so I can see what I can do to help. Yeah, I got a buddy. Um, he's been my best friend of uh, about 30 years. Bandmate, mm -hmm. teammate, researcher. Um, his name's Bobby White. Um, he's one of the hardest working people that I know. He, um, His wife, um, she's had some hard times with some issues. Uh, she's got some kind of bone uh, disease or disorder. I don't know if it's osteoporosis or I don't, I don't know what, what it was, what it's called, but she, it didn't help when she fell off her horse and broke her back. Mm -hmm. Um, that's when things kind of started to go downhill. Uh, he just b bought 10 acres, built a brand new house on it. I mean, he, he was at the stage of his life where he wanted to be. Um, but with, uh, all these surgeries, um, that his wife has had, his entire life savings is gone. His savings account is drained. Um, and now he's saving what little he can between paychecks to pay for surgery mm -hmm. that's scheduled for Friday. And she's already had two, one or two surgeries on that hand. Um, and if this surgery doesn't get done, she's probably going to lose full function of that hand. And um, they started a GoFundMe page. Um, and um, at the last I checked, they were like at uh, 1200 and something. And their goal was 5000 for Friday. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, you know, I, a uh, singer, songwriter, um, I wrote a children's book. I've had no success with reaching out to people on Facebook and no success reaching out to people in inner circles with any of that. Um, people just don't seem to, uh, um, want to help in that way, probably because it's more of an accomplishment, not a need. Um, but Bobby and Lori, um, they're great people. And like I said, Bobby's the hardest working person. He's never asked for help that I can ever remember. Uh, he's like me. If he can't get it with these two hands, he can't get it. And um, they're in a financial mess. And he's never, ever asked me for help, even though he knows I'd be there. Um, but he reached out to me um, when I reached out to you just five minutes before he reached I reached out to you. Um, he reached out to me and I'm like, I'll, I'll do everything I can, whatever I can, however I can. Um, uh, and, and, and that's where we're at. We, we need help. So um, they continue living their life. Um, she can get the surgery that she needs um, and hopefully relieve a little bit of this ongoing financial burden that they've had because of her medical issues well i'll tell you what this is what i want you to do um i want you to send me that link i'm gonna post it on this video and ladies and gentlemen i want you to listen to me we're in the christmas season it's the giving season and take opportunity to help these people out i'm gonna go ahead and give 150 dollars to them um now and if you break it up and if i mean it'll probably be 20 30 000 people hear this easily um that's 100 bucks i mean that's 50 bucks from hundred people will get the job done to help them out. But anything you guys can do, ladies and gentlemen, to help do it. Um, I'm not one of those guys that ask for super chats. You never see me doing any of that. I barely even sell my website anymore um, because God blesses me in so many different ways. So if you can help, help. Um, and I'll post the link in the description. Now, prior to me posting the link, I'm going to go through and vet everything myself. So you ain't got to worry about nobody beating you out the money, but I'm going to post it. And then if you can support, support, um, you're spending money anyway. So if you got 50 bucks, give 50 bucks. If you got 20 bucks, give 20 bucks. Whatever you can give the help, go ahead and do it and help. And Jimmy, I'm going to ask that you email that to me as soon as we get off the line. Is there, um, is there anything else you want to share with us before I let you go? Because we got another interview I'm buttoned up on in probably about 10 minutos. Uh, no. Um, you know, uh, again, um, the hardest part, of that encounter that happened to me was um, one, I didn't feel like I deserved it, but two, the sensation of the warmth that started here mm -hmm. and it went all the way down and to my feet, like into the ground, the paralyzation, the knowing it's happened, but couldn't do anything about it, being frozen. Um, it was really, it was really, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I was scared about what had happened because again, in this time frame, all that happened in that time frame, I went from this to bawling, um, and seeing all that in that amount of time. And, you know, when I explained it to, uh, friend of mine he's a preacher his name's Abel he's a um, he's a he does a Latino online um, service um, and speaks Spanish and he speaks in tongue and I watch him all, all the time I can't understand the lick of it but I can kind of feel a bit of it you know mm -hmm. um, when I explained to him about what had happened uh, he's like you know I've had that um, he struggled with drugs and selling drugs and the, and the lifestyle of drugs and his daughter dying at a young age. And um, it that feeling, that washed over feeling that he said you were touched by God mm -hmm. is what turned him around. He's like, no way in a million years did I think I'd be a preacher. But now I can't think of doing anything else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then when I explained to him about suicide, only one other time that I had that feeling. And it was when I went to Clearwater and we were in a 
condo and we're like 15 floors up and the view was great in the living room. But then you walk over here and go to the bedroom and go out on the balcony. Every time I broke that threshold to go on the balcony, something heavy was telling me to jump, but I didn't want to jump. I would come back in and that heaviness would go away. I would go around the wall and go into the living room and go out on the balcony. It was not there on that balcony. I could see the balcony over here in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. But I went back out on this balcony two or three times and it was, it was overwhelming jump, but I didn't want to jump. It was overwhelming to jump. And I shut the door and I told my wife and she's like, never go in this room again. (laughs) Stay out of that room and I told I didn't know any about any of the spiritual stuff and and you know Abel had mentioned he's like you had a suicide uh what do you call it a suicidal suicide spirit the spirit of suicide spirit <laughs> yes he said you had a suicidal spirit I think is what he said mm-hmm. um and he's like and 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 it was probably madder than you can believe that you will overcome it without praying to God without saying the word of Jesus. Um, I didn't want to jump, but the feeling of doing it was overwhelming. I, it, it wasn't like that in the other, other balcony. It was only in that spot. It didn't make any sense. Um, so I've dealt with that. Um, but as far as, I don't know, I, when I say, when people ask me if I'm spiritual, I say no, but I don't know if, if that's the case or if I just, am I with what happened to me? Am I, am I spiritual or am I just still just trying to only get what I can provide and need with these two hands? Well, know, we're all spiritual. Asking. That's the thing that people don't get. We're all spiritual. We're all spirits in a human body experiencing life. So in essence, we are nothing more than spirits. So based on the law of territory in the Bible, no spirit can function on this planet in this realm without a body, right? And so if you understand the law of territory, when God made man and woman, he made Adam and Eve, he made a spirit for them first, then he made a body, he put those spirits inside of a body. We're all spiritual at our core because we are spirits that are experiencing life in this realm, right? And so you are spiritual. The essence of everything that you deal with is spiritual. And what you've been experiencing your whole life is spiritual warfare. And I'll say this to you, the level of spiritual warfare that you've experienced is always complementary to the level of what you're supposed to be doing. So the simple fact that you've experienced things in this nature at this strength means that there's something phenomenal that you're supposed to be doing and that you should do. And that's why you're getting fought like this. Like when the spirit of suicide came at me, it was trying to kill me before we got to this moment and this time where I came to the knowledge of God, who I can help people and bring people to him. But it was like, oh, no, because nothing's here in the, hidden in the spirit realm. All things are revealed there. It would say, oh, no, we can't let this guy get to this age at this time where he can do this thing because it's going to be a problem. So they've been pursuing you for a very long time. And I'll say yeah. this to you. Anytime that tries to rear its head and those thoughts start coming in your mind, it's real easy. You know what? You know it's not your thoughts because you've experienced it. You say, listen, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. Leave me alone and watch. Boop, gone. Just like that. I'll give you another suggestion that will help you tremendously. Uh, And I've been telling, trying to explain this to people, and I'll be doing a deep dive on it. The simple fact that you dedicate a place in your home to God, I call it an altar to God. Like behind me, if I move, you'll see... There's a Bible there. There's a little scripture on a stone. There's anointing oil there. In my house, there's two altars. Here in this office, there's an altar. And what ends up happening is when you give space to him in your life and you say, okay, God, I welcome you in. And I build a space for you, an altar. An altar is a landing strip where spirits land. That's why you see in witchcraft, people have altars with candles and all the rest of the stuff. If you read throughout the whole Old Testament in the Bible, it's full of people talking about altars. Well, when you design and you build one of them and dedicate a space for him in your house, then you're saying, okay, I welcome you in. And that altar that you tend to by praying, fasting, just going into the room and talking, like if you're feeling down like today, I went in the room and I got on my face and said, pops, this is bothering me. This is bothering me. This is bothering me. What do you want me to do? How do I deal with this? Take this from me. Boop, 
gone. No, not even a thought of it. Get up, come out and go on about my business. As you do that, there's his presence is there and it fights all that foolishness. Like there's family members that come to my house that are in heated arguments before they leave their house. When they walk into my door, the argument stops like that. And they'd be like, man, it's, they don't want to leave. They're like, man, it's so peaceful here. You know, we want to hang out, stay as long as you want. But it's the environment that's controlled because God is there and he is peace. So there's peace there. And so you control that environment by inviting him in. You do that. Watch how the sleep changes, uh, any arguments, all that stuff just goes away because in his presence, you can't have all that foolishness. And he's going to sit there and say, OK, something's causing them to argue and fight. Let me hammer this out. Work it out. Oh, something's affecting his sleep. Let me hammer that out. And then as it as you do it more and more and as it becomes more powerful, it's called servicing in the, the altar. As you service your altar of God even more and more by praying, fasting, singing, then it supercharges it to where um, you get to the point to where with me, like crazy stuff happens in my house. I mean, insane stuff happens where I'm sitting there chilling, watching TV and you'll see something move. And I'm like, what was that? It ain't nothing bad, but there's there's things in our house protecting us. And people have witnessed it because they've tried to use sorcery and witchcraft. And they say, well, oh, you know, we did this and this happened. No. You're not fighting me. You're fighting God because you're trying to hurt one of his sons. And so that's my suggestion to you, bro. Do that and watch how things start to change because he has a very, very powerful way he wants to use you. And you've experienced it. It's just all the pieces to the puzzle haven't been put together. Once those pieces to the puzzle connect, bro, you're going to be amazed. I mean, you're going to be absolutely amazed at what happens in your life. It's going to be phenomenal. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's been my friend Jimmy Barr. We spent some time hanging out with him. We got another interview. We got a knockout in seven minutes. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Jimmy, I want to thank you. Tell people if they want to reach out to you, where can they find some of the information on you? I don't know if you're really doing a whole bunch public. You may just be on the old shows. How do they get in contact with you? Is there anything you want to promote? Um. Well, I mean, what about the book? They can always. Um, well, my daughter, uh, um, Carly, um, she's uh, four and she's autistic. And every time I think about her, um, it just makes me smile. And uh, one day at work, I was thinking about her and this stupid, ridiculous idea of you should write a children's book came to mind. And my grammar's atrocious, but I finished it that day, got it published. Um, it's at a couple of the Barnes and Noble stores. It's online at Barnes and Noble. It's online at Amazon. Her name is Carly, and the title of the book is called Carly the Princess Dragon because I can't write about bunnies and and puppy dogs. Dragons are cool, so I had to make it about <laughs> dragons. But it's it's basically about the a baby dragon's first day and her adventures along the way type of thing. Um, so I mean, you know, they can always. Uh, for the princess in your life, you know, you got a daughter, a granddaughter, um, a, a daycare, uh, um, you know, if you if a children's hospital, if you uh, work at a pediatrician's, uh, you know, office, you know, these kind of this kind of book is be great for uh, anywhere. You know, uh, Christmas is coming up, may not get to you by then because it's coming up really quick. But um, there's that, you know, I've got some songs out, from, um, but. You know, I, I don't ever really promote that stuff. Um, you know, um, I I don't really ever promote me or any any anything I do. I just I always feel like that somebody else should be promoting me, not me, because it feels weird to me. Um, I've never gotten that down yet. You know, uh, <clears throat> the one time I tried to ask somebody and tell somebody about my stuff, they called me conceited, and oh, really? that uh. Yes, that struck a chord, and I was like, uh, "Now I'm just really excited about one of my songs world, won a World Songwriting Award." Uh, I just wanted to know if you wanted to listen to it and check it out, you know, uh, um, because I was proud. You know, thirty nine thousand songs were submitted, and my song was nominated and won a award. I mean, I would, it's you know, it's, it's not a, it's not MTV Awards. It's a World's Independent Artists Award, you know, World Songwriting Award, but. Um, it struck a chord with me. Um, man, am I really coming off conceited? I'm not very good at this. <laughs> um, so I just stopped, you know. Um, I've got three songs that are in the ranking. I've almost finished, uh, actually, because of my um, religious experience, my, my spiritual experience, I started writing a Christian song called You Can. 
Um, and I think it's going to be good when it's done. Um, but uh, it's just a matter of finishing everything with the time I have. One an autistic child in the house. Um, she's four, got a 16 year old and a 12 year old. There's not a whole lot of free time. Right. She's not. Right. right. Trust me. I know. I know. Well, I'll tell you what, reject whatever that person told you and start talking about yourself. You're a phenomenal guy, really cool down earth guy. And that's just a way of blocking your blessing, man. Talk about what you've been doing, promote yourself, put it out there. People going to always have something negative to say, bro, if you ever read my comment section, you lose your mind. Cause I read the comment and be like, Oh, this person said this band, band, band. Cause people, I mean, unless they <laughs> really know you, bro. I mean, it's preconceived notion. So if they don't know you, yeah. then it's just what most of the time is them projecting what they believe about themselves onto you. And so I just say, okay, you can project whatever you want. Ban, block, ban. I got like 40,000 people blocked, bro. It's ridiculous. I don't care. I mean, I, I really don't. I'm, I'm secure in my identity. I know who I am and I know the person that I am. And that's where we have to, you. in order to be successful, that's where we have to rest in. I know who I am as a person. All right, brother Jimmy, it's great talking to you, my friend, man. Uh, we'll get back together soon, bro. We'll get back together soon, but I need uh -huh. you to send me the link. You got to send me the link. Okay. All gotcha. right, brother. Good talking to you. Appreciate it. So there are days when you just want it all to end. The drama, the bills, the problems on the job. Today I can comfortably say that I was in a very low place. My son's tuition for school was due and I was a thousand dollars short. No way to come up with the money and so I went to the school to discuss the issue with them and they told me I had seven days. Or my son would be kicked out of the school. As a father we are supposed to carry a lot of weight. It is how God made men. But this day the weight was too heavy and I went to the woods just to get away and pray. I'm there sitting with my back up against a tree, eyes closed, saying, God, I'm not sure why I'm feeling like this is all too much, but I could use a little help here. I'm just listing the things I need help with. I was afraid of failing my family. I was worried that things were falling apart. It was so much on my mind in that moment that I just let it all out and cried. How many of you listening know that men do cry, real men, not crying in public for all to see, whining like a little bitch? I mean, real men go to the secret place and cry out to God for help. When I stood up, things were not better, but I felt better about the situation. Walking back through the woods to my car, my mind was clear, no longer clouded with the fear and doubt. And when I get in the car, I have three missed calls on my cell phone. One is my wife, one is my son who was at school, and one was from a number that was just unknown. So I call my wife back first and she's asking what I wanted for dinner and inquiring about how things went with the school. I'm honest with her and tell her we only have seven days before they put him out. She sighs in worry and asks, what are we gonna do? And I tell her I will figure it out. Then I call my son at school and he tells me he had a fight because kids were calling us poor. Turns out the teachers were gossiping about how I was always late with tuition, so I head back to school and deal with that situation. Just as I'm leaving the school, the number calls back 0000000, 000 000, and I answer, agitated, what the hell is this? The voice sounded British, like a robot voice, and it says, you need money and I have something I need. For $10,000, will you retrieve something from the woods for me? I saw you there today. I'm like, listen, whoever you are, I don't have time for bullshit. I assure you, this is not bullshit, Mr. Clemens. This is a real opportunity. There is something that is very dear to me that is within the woods you just left. However, I'm not capable of getting it myself. For $10,000, will you retrieve it for me? Why, why can't you get it? You have tried. Let's just say that certain parties are at odds with me and they will not allow me into those woods. Now the area he was talking about where I would go to pray is nothing special about it at all. 
It's just a few miles south of our home on McKee, Kentucky. Hell, it's not too far from the church. So I say, if you are serious, I need a thousand dollars to pay my son's tuition. Cash app me a thousand dollars and I will go to the area where you want me to. And if I find what it is, I will bring it to you and you send me the rest of the money. Or not at least my son's tuition is paid. The voice says you have a deal. I'm digging through my phone to get the cash app address when I see $1,000 is deposited and I immediately transfer it to my bank account and say, send me the location and what I'm looking for. The voice says, you are searching for the foundation of a small shed that is in the woods. You will find the concrete slab. What I need is already there in a hole under the concrete. When you get this, I will call you. So we hang up and I call the school and pay the tuition by phone. Well, $980 of the tuition and tell them I will bring them $20 bucks in a few days. Then I head to this spot, 37 4143107687109 Hell, it was a little bit of trouble getting there, but nothing a man wouldn't do for $10,000. And when I get there, there is no slab of concrete. There is this chunk of broken concrete like someone had been there years and years ago. I'm there digging around looking to see if I can find anything of value. And there is nothing, I mean nothing, an old tin box. You could tell someone lived here a long time ago, found an old rusted skillet. So rusted that there were holes in it and the more I looked around it was just junk spread around in the woods. Then the phone rings and it's the voice but the reception is terrible and I hear it saying I need a blank. I'm like, I can't hear you. What am I looking for? Then the call drops. So I start to head back to the car where I can get some type of reception and I'm walking and something runs by me. You know how in those cartoons like the Roadrunner, it's a blur, a flash. Well, that happens and this thing is as big as hell, shoots past me and runs straight uphill. For a moment, I thought I was losing it, but I felt the wind from the speed it was moving. So now I'm standing there. I was not afraid. Because it moved so fast, I didn't really see it, but I knew something was wrong. But I keep walking and get back to the car. 20 yards away, the phone rings, and it's the voice, and he says, Did you get it? I explained that I could not hear what he was saying. Get what? He says there is an antique metal lockbox there. I need that. It's very valuable to me. Now I saw a tin box, but that could not have been it. So I told him I saw a tin box, and he said, No, not that trash. This is a green rusted lockbox. It belongs to my great grandfather. I need it. Just before the voice hangs up, it says they know you are there now, so be fast about it. They? So I headed back. At least I knew what I was looking for. And as I'm walking back, at first I thought it was the spots in your eyes. You know, the floaters that when you look in a direction, they dart with your vision. But the closer I got, the clearer. I realized that there was something running back and forth so fast that it was like Superman moving in the woods. Now, I'm at the point where I'm 20 yards away from the stuff and this thing comes running right in front of me. And it was crazy as hell because it speeds up to me. And it was like it slowed down for a fraction of a second to show me its face, turned and looked at me. And you know how online there are those jump scare scenes where it's like a face jumps out at you, then it disappears. Well, that is what it did. I see this snarling face of what looks like a black wolf snarling so fast. It was fucking terrifying. You can't help but be scared. That type of fear runs up and down your spine and into your bones. It makes your legs weak and that is what happened. They turned to mush and I felt like I was gonna pass out. My legs wobbling, I decided to keep going and what was crazy was that the fear went away. So now I'm moving back to the area and searching around and I see what looks like a box sticking out the ground and so I grab it, didn't care if it was the right box or not. I just took it and got to moving out of there. I'm walking uphill when I hear this howling coming from down below but it's not in my direction. It's like this thing is howling to the north and it was then that I felt like, okay dude, you need to get the hell out of here. I know it does not make sense, but the entire time I felt like it could not hurt me. Like it was just trying to scare me off. But something changed. It was like it was telling on me. I just knew I had to get the hell out of there. 
So now I'm running as fast as I can to get back to the car and get out of there. Once inside, I'm now speeding on those back roads. And when I get back into town, I'm just sitting there. One hour passes, two hours pass, no phone call, nothing. So I start to fiddle with the box and try and get it open. But its lock is rusted over. I was digging in the glove box for a knife to pry it open when the phone rings and it's the voice. Do you have the box? Yes, good. Bring it to me, he gives me an address on Sand Springs Road, south of Mount Vernon. So, I head in that direction. This is where it really gets crazy. As soon as I enter Mount Vernon, the phone rings and it's him. And he says, did they show themselves to you? I'm like, if by they you mean a freaking monster, yes. What the hell was that? He says it takes a special type of man to be in the woods with them. My great-grandfather was that type of man, I'm not. I tried and that is how I ended up the way I am today. Exactly how is that, I asked. And he says, you will see. Make a left. It was like he was watching my every move. As I turn down Sand Springs Road, he says, come further down and then make a right, the gate will be open. Listen, I turn off the road into the property and it's not a big house by any means, but it did stand out. As soon as I park, this man comes out the door, walking with a cane, younger man, 45 years old or so. His face looks like it has been through a meat grinder. He is dragging one leg, and he has absolutely no regard for me. He says, let me see the box, snatches it out my hand, and walks over to my car, places it on the hood, and starts inspecting it, saying this might just be it. I have been trying for five years to get this. The man looked crazy, eyes bugged wide open. He was more scary than what I saw in the woods. I'm like, listen, how about we square up on the money? I don't care what's in that box. All I know is there were monsters in those woods, and clearly you tried to get it and they fucked you up bad. So whatever you and them things have going is your business. He is ignoring me as I talk fucking with that box, so much so that I scream. Hey, where is my money? Have you ever seen a villain in a movie look back over their shoulder with that evil look? That is how he looked at me, and he says, You get nothing else until this box is open. If what I need is here, then you get paid. Understand. The look in his eyes was that of obsession, not possession. Like he had been obsessing over this for years. Now I'm thinking, fuck it, I got the tuition paid. I'm done with this dude. He can keep his money. He pulls out a pocket knife and breaks the rusted hinges off the box and opens it. For a moment I thought he had a heart attack or a stroke because he starts to stammer back like he is falling. And then he screams, Yes! Yes! Finally I have it. By now I'm at the driver's side door of my car and I'm like this bitch is crazy. Looking at him, his face all distorted. He looked crazy like something from the hills have eyes and I'm like, I'm out as I'm getting in the car, he says. Stay here. I will give you your money. And he walks back into the house. I sit there for ten minutes and nothing. Then he walks back outside with a brown paper bag and says, here is your money. If you are interested in going back, there is more that I would like to recover and I'm like, nope, I will pass. He is bent over looking into my driver's side window and when he smiles he looks flat out evil i'm like no sir thanks do you mind if i ask what was in the box and he says it's none of my business snaps personality changes and he is now talking like that british robot like he has split personalities or some shit. so i pull off drive home and tell my wife what happened you know how it is when you are talking to someone and they think you are bullshitting. My wife has that look on her face until I show her the $9 grand. That night in bed, we start to look up what I saw and it turns out it fits the description of dog man to the letter, the speed, the face, the eyes. The shit was crazy. My wife seems to believe that God answered my prayer, but I'm not sure. All I know is we got everything caught up. Car notes, house notes, tuition, everything. That number called me one other time and he asked if I would go back, said that 12 people had tried and I was the only one successful at it. My reply was, hell no, I'm not pushing my luck.
with all these park ranger stories running around out here, I'm just going to be honest with you. They're not telling you the truth. First of all, they never delegate and tell you which organization they work for. For example, there are park rangers that work for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Then there's park rangers that work for the Department of the Army. Then there are others that work for the National Park Services. Then there's park rangers that work for the National Department of U.S. Interior. I've listened to a lot of park ranger stories, and me being a member of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and a real park ranger listening to this stuff, it's all bullshit and crap. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm tired of it. I'm sick and tired of people making up stories about monsters that they never saw. And I want to be clear with you. I'm not saying that they don't exist because, yes, they do exist. But these people have never saw them. Now, let me say this to you. As a member of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, working as a park ranger, my job is to travel. And I have traveled to probably more state parks and national forests than anybody in this organization. And I will say this to you about state parks and national forests. They are very, very dangerous places. And I don't want you to get it misconstrued. I'm not calling them dangerous because of the native species that live there, whether it be mountain lions or bears or rattlesnakes or moccasins in Louisiana or alligators or crocodiles down in Florida. I'm talking about the dangers that no one else will explain to you. And this story that I'm about to share with you is about one such danger. Now, I'm not going to disclose what park location this happened in, but I will disclose details to you so you will understand if you find yourself in the woods and you run across this, that the best option for you is to flee. When I tell you to flee, I mean run like you just broke out of prison and keep running and keep running and keep running. Don't look back. Don't try and reason with what you saw. Don't do anything but run because there is no option other than escaping or dying. Now, let me paint the scene for you and tell you how I found out about this particular monster. I'm in Arizona two years ago. The problem with the migrant crisis has already spun out of control. It just hit the news recently how bad it is. But back then, it was already out of control. And I'm being called in in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. It's being called in to consult on this plan coming from Washington, D.C. to house these migrants inside of our national parks and forests. Why? Because if you stuffed them there, the U.S. citizens would not know that they were there. Out of sight, out of mind. While I come in town, head into the office, we have the meeting. We're sitting there talking about this proposed plan to build temporary housing for them inside of the park. The meeting is going extremely well until one of the National Park Service Rangers says, listen, I understand why this is being done. I understand what's being proposed to be done, but I think this is a terrible idea, especially at this location. He he proceeds to say that there are things that come from beneath the earth and they hunt deer and other game in this particular area. Listen to me. He wouldn't go into vast details of what these things were, but he just said they were extremely dangerous. And in his professional opinion, it was a terrible, terrible idea. Fast forward about an hour later, they decide that they're going to approve the scope of work and that we're going to go out there and start doing estimates. So it's me as a park ranger from the U.S. Corps of Engineers, him as a park ranger from the National Forest Services, and another gentleman who was a park ranger from the U.S. Army Division of Justice. He leads us to the site location, and as we are on our way to the site location, I'm talking about there's nothing but deer caucuses everywhere. Deers hung up in trees. Deer skins hung up in trees. I'm telling you, it was spooky. Like we went to a location where cannibals lived and thrived. Now, as we're walking along, asking him questions, he says, now you see why I said this is the wrong location. So now I'm asking him questions about what is doing this. What could be doing this? He looks at me and says, there are some things that's just too hard to explain. You have to see them for yourself. And the more time we spend in this area, believe me, you will see them for yourself. So we proceed along and get directly to the site. And let me say this to you. The site itself would have been perfect. It was on a small plateau close to fresh, clean water. It would have been super easy to cut in and access road right to this location. It really was the perfect site to build a temporary migrant shelter. Combine that with the fact that the location basically was well hidden. I mean, it achieved each and every goal and objective. 
Imagine the scene. We've been on location for about 20 minutes discussing everything. And I'm looking at it, trying to figure out the orientation of how we would actually seat the facility. And by seat, I mean where we would set things up. When you start to hear the shrieking coming from up above the plateau in these trees. Now, initially, it sounded like some type of bird shrieking and screeching. Then it gets louder. But this one is coming from the west. Then we hear the screeching from the east. And soon come to realize that, nope, 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 these are not birds. This is something communicating at far distances. Now, get this. Five minutes after that, you start to hear what sounds like something climbing up the trees, like claws gripping the trees. Then after that, you start to hear things jumping from tree to tree while witnessing the trees shaking. So now both of us are looking at the park service rangers and saying, what the fuck is going on? He says, now, see, this is what I was telling you all about in the meeting. I don't think that they will attack us, but... I'm not sure, so I suggest we get the hell out of here. Now listen, I'm going to pause right here, and I'm going to pay the proper honor and respect to Connor. Connor was the guy who was a park ranger for the U.S. Army. As all of this is going on, and it's quite a bit of commotion going on, Connor draws his weapon, looks at us, and says, Well, guys, we do have weapons on us. There's no need for us to be afraid. If something comes from these trees, we're just going to kill it, and we're going to drag it back, and we're going to see what it is. It was almost like in that moment, Connor broke through the layer of fear. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but for me, that's what he did. We did have weapons on us. There was no need to truly be afraid, so we finished doing our job. But as we were doing our job, these things were making the loudest noises and rackets you would ever heard, screeching, screaming, shaking trees, all kinds of foolishness. Then Connor saw one of them, and I need you to understand something. I didn't see it, but he did. And after seeing this, his whole demeanor changed about what we should and shouldn't be doing. Because he walks over to us, he says, listen, we're going to need to get out of here and we're going to need to get out of here quickly. There's no way in hell we can put any human being in this location. No way. Then he starts to walk away, leaving us standing there. And here we go. Get this. We leave that location, get back to our vehicles. And when we get back to our vehicles, Connor describes exactly what he saw. He said it was a pale, skinny, humanoid creature, legs longer than their arms, way longer, with heads that were turned upside down where the chin was where the forehead should be, and the forehead was where the chin should be, but everything else was in proportion. He said their eyes was where a human's mouth was, and their mouth is where a human's eyes were. He said they were naked, skinny, emaciated, and you can see these green veins running through their entire bodies. Fast forward about 35 days later, we have another meeting. We give our official recommendation based on the site, based on the location, based on the environment. This is not suitable for any human being. And guess what they did? They approved it and they started building it anyway. Listen to me. Two weeks after the temporary facility was built, they shipped people into there. And then a week later, they were forced to shut it down. Now, I don't have the direct proof as to what went on there. Now, listen, I'm not going to make a definitive statement as to what actually went on there, because to make a definitive statement in my job position means that I'm disclosing something to you. But what I will say to you is this. I have heard rumors from people in high places that heard rumors from other people that went to the site that 15 human beings were taken and eaten, not just taken. They were eaten. 